I don't have uh, professional expertise, but I've tried to study since I retired 10 years ago and study these war and peace issues and hopefully I can give you some information that will help you make uh, informed decisions with the terrible situations we're facing. Uh, my last name, by the way, is the original Norwegian is Kavali, but uh, we say it Kwali. When we, my grandfather came over here, people couldn't handle the KV sound, so it just kind of morphed, and now we say it quality. The crisis with North Korea. Up to uh, most of the, through most of the Cold War, the great fear was that there would be a miscalculation or some type of accident involving nuclear weapons. You remem may remember 25 years ago, a Russian technician saw what looked like five missiles coming toward Russia. So he notified Yeltsin, told him to get ready to launch an attack in retaliation. But he was very experienced and he noticed that it didn't look right on his radar. There shouldn't be five missiles, there should be a lot more if Russia were being attacked. So he waited and he contacted somebody on the ground and got confirmation. It was not an attack. It was a radar echo from five weather balloons sent up from Norway. If he would have been younger, inexperienced, or panicked, Yeltsin may have launched a full-fledged nuclear attack on the United States. His name is Stanislav Petrov, and a film about him was made called The Man Who Saved the World. He may not have saved the world, but he saved certainly a good portion of it. So that was the great fear. And there have been a couple of other close calls also. But now, just in this last year, we have a new fear, and that's of two men. You all know who I mean. There's Donald Trump, our new president, and Kim Jong-un of North Korea. They've issued um, threats against each other, especially in September. These threats have a certain adolescent character to them. The trouble is, these men command huge military arsenals and nuclear weapons. So we have to try to understand so we can avoid a potential war. Uh, sources I'm using for this, I'll, I'll give the Korea section about 30, 35 minutes, and then maybe it can be about 10 minutes for questions. And then the second part of the talk will be on the new UN Treaty on abolishing nuclear weapons. That'll be shorter, but then we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end to have questions on that or any more questions you may have. The uh, leading American historian on the Korean War is Bruce Cummings, and his book is called The Korean War, listed there. That's 1950 to 1953. Can North Korea Be Stopped is an article by Mark Bowden in the Atlantic Magazine this summer. and he makes there are four options, he says, we have dealing, for dealing with North Korea. All of them are bad. We could try to invade the country, but they have a million-man army. Remember when we invaded Iraq, 50,000 guerrilla fighters gave us all kinds of trouble. We could try a decapitation strike, take out their leaders, especially Kim Jong-un, Un, but there are a lot of complications with that. We could try to strangulate the country with sanctions and economic pressure, but there are difficulties with that, and he goes through this in the article. The fourth option is to continue with uh, containment and deterrence, and he thinks that's what we'll probably have to wind up doing. It's not what we want, but maybe that's what we will have to settle for. The next article, The Risk of Nuclear War with North Korea by Evan Osnos, gives a lot of good insights into Kim Jong-un. Who is this guy? Well, he's the third in the Kim dynasty. And when he was young, he was spoiled. They said they gave him anything he wanted. He used to strut around in a military uniform. And then he liked the Chicago Bulls basketball team. So they got him DVDs of the Chicago Bulls games and he invited Michael Jordan to come over for a visit. 
after he became ruler of the country, but instead he got Dennis Rodman. <laughs> I'm all for Dennis Rodman if he can make friends. Uh, so not much was expected of him when he took over six years ago, but he's turned out to be both very vicious and very aggressive, much more than anybody anticipated. Very dangerous man. A uh, third article was slouching toward war with North Korea by Nicholas Kristof, the New York Times. He was in North Korea about a month ago. And uh, two important points, one are there's no dissent in North Korea. If you dissent, you just don't say it out loud or publicly. So everybody is behind the leader in North Korea. If you aren't, you probably get sent to a prison camp or worse. So they're ready to fight. The second point he said is that we're still on a collision course. We are demanding they denuclearize. They get rid of their weapons and they get rid of their missiles and they get rid of their nuclear materials. But after working on this for 25 years, that's not likely to happen. In the same way, they want us to pull back from our war games, our maneuvers. We've had um, military exercises for years and years right off their coast, practicing for an invasion or military action of one kind or another. And if they, you were a small country and had this large, powerful country continually practicing military maneuvers and flying their planes over your country, of course, you would want them to cut back on this and get rid of this aspect of the situation. So he says we, we're still on the collision course. There hasn't been any meeting of the minds on those two aspects. Uh, Graham Allison is a veteran teacher of government at Harvard. His article is, Will Trump and Z Solve North Korea? In other words, maybe China can really take care of this problem, but his brief answer is no, China really won't, and we'll get into the reasons for that in a few minutes. Now the hostility or the opposition between the Koreans and Americans goes back, of course, to the first Korean War, 1950 to 1953. After World War II, Communism started to spread through Asia, mainly in China, so it became Red China, and then over into Korea and under Soviet influence. And we decided to split Korea by an arbitrary division across the middle of the country to the 38th parallel. So North Korea became the Soviet area of influence and South Korea, we kept troops there and we've had the troops there in South Korea ever since. Um, during the Korean War, it started the North invaded in June of 1950. It was quite a surprise. They drove the South Koreans and Americans back toward the south southeastern corner of the country. There were emergency meetings at the UN. Um, other countries sent troops. We sent uh, reserves under General MacArthur. He drove the North Koreans back through the country, across the 38th parallel and deep into North Korea. However, he didn't anticipate the Chinese. In December of 1950, the Chinese sent two waves of nearly a million men across the border and overwhelmed our forces. The brutal fighting in the middle of the winter, they drove us back gradually back toward the 38th parallel. So at the end of 1950, they had forced us back to the middle of the country. The last two years of the war were rather inconclusive. Uh, our side would push 50 miles up and then they'd push us back. And then they'd push us 50 miles farther south and then we'd push, push them back. Uh, the way we fought the war mainly was from the air. We bombed and we bombed and we bombed and we bombed. More bombs were dropped on North Korea than in the entire Pacific theater of World War II. But North Korea is very rugged territory, a lot of low mountains with thousands of caves and hiding places. People 
hid in the caves, they ate beans and rice, and they kept sending forces. They were very tenacious. And you can see there the huge losses. We lost about 36,000. Uh, the Chinese lost 700,000. Their supply lines were very long and they didn't have good leadership. And Bruce Cummings estimated the North, or the Koreans, North and South, lost three million, including large numbers of civilians. So this is seared into the memory of the Koreans, especially the North Koreans. The grandparents tell stories and there's no reason, I mean, you can see why they consider the U.S. the great enemy. We, of course, were fighting the spread of international communism, which we considered a great evil, and we had to stop over in that area of the world. Both sides were exhausted. Eisenhower uh, campaigned and a promise to end the war, and when he was elected, he came over and did it. There was a ceasefire that was declared, but there was no peace treaty signed. So technically, the two sides are still at war. They set up the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone, which is misnamed because there's heavy military presence on both sides. There's just this barren strip of land about 150 miles long through the middle of the country. So that's important consideration that Technically, there was no peace treaty ever signed. Now, after that, the, the two parts of Korea developed in quite different ways. In the south, it took about 10 years, but they got the economy going, and they developed an open capitalistic society, very successful, had well-known companies like Samsung and uh, Hyundai, big uh, economic boom, not quite the paradise it's sometimes depicted. They've had a lot of political corruption in South Korea. Uh, several months ago, a million people turned out to protest the president and they threw her out of office on corruption charges. So it's not uh, everything that's always put out to be. In the North, though, they developed this uh, closed repressive communist society very authoritarian, under the Kim dynasty. They had uh, a lot of propaganda from an early age, four years old and up. They're taught to rever revere their great leaders, of the Kim dynasty. You go in North Korea and you see the posters everywhere of the three members of the dynasty. And they had prison camps they developed. It's estimated more than 100,000 people Thousands have been tortured, thousands have been executed. Maybe not quite the, like the Russian gulag or the Nazi camps, but definitely very severe and secretive. And if you made waves or made trouble, that's where you wound up. So uh, President Trump nine days ago in South Korea painted a very dark picture of North Korea. And a lot of what he said is correct. However, life has improved in the last several years. The economy has improved. They've had building in, in Pyongyang. People out in the countryside have DVDs and uh, TVs and newspapers. They've always had problem with food shortages in the Northeast especially. In the 1990s, they had a great famine. More than a million people died. China was the one country who gave them some support to get through that. But still, it's a very closed autocratic society, heavy on propaganda, starting at age four and going up. A uh, defector several months ago reported there's an atmosphere of fear around Kim Jong-un. If you say the wrong thing, or it's like being around Stalin. You are executed, maybe hopefully sent to a prison camp, but he's executed numerous people. His own uh, half-brother he had smothered with poison gas, you may remember. Another cabinet official was caught sleeping during a meeting, and he was executed, and several others. 
So he's a very dangerous, vicious person in that respect. Now there are always hopes that the two Koreas could be reunited and they could um, get together again and have one nation. But something always seems to happen. In the 1990s they had what was called the Sunshine Policy and thousands of families were reunited with relatives in the other half of the country and there was great hope that they could work with this and reunite the country much the way that Germany was reunited from, from, with the East and West. However, there always seemed to be border incidents that happened. There were attacks. There are tunnels that go under the DMZ. Groups of troops would show up on the wrong side. There would be various attacks on both sides. Uh, the worst was probably a ship that the South Koreans sank and 46 North Korean sailors were killed about six years ago. So the border incidents are one of the main reasons the reuni reunification or has not developed the way people had hoped. Now, they started um, developing their nuclear program in the early 1990s. They do have some sources of uranium. And the idea, of course, was to eventually get a bomb, which would be the great weapon and the great deterrent. We, of course, didn't want them to do this, so we had uh, a lot of negotiations attempting to see if we could stop this program. One was called the Agreed Framework in 1994, but that fell through because the North Koreans said we didn't deliver on the uh, supplies of fuel oil we, we were supposed to send them. In the year 2000, just as at the end of the Clinton administration, uh, we had the six-party talks, but uh, this focus suddenly turned to the Middle East and they weren't continued. So we came fairly close on two occasions. Now when Bush became president, he put North Korea into the axis of evil. We might remember that from 2002. Even though North Korea has really nothing much in common with Iraq or Iran. So that really set things back. In 2005, however, we were negotiating, negotiating again, and it looked like we might have a potential agreement, but that one also fell through. Chris Hill, who was a veter veteran negotiator, said the North Koreans are the toughest people he's ever worked with. They just hardly ever give an inch. They were very mm -hmm. determined to proceed. After we invaded Iraq in 2003, um, the North Korean leaders saw what happened when they didn't have a bomb or didn't have the nuclear program. That gave them more incentive to continue. Obama became president, and he developed a policy of what's called strategic patience. Basically, we would monitor what they were doing, and we would keep our forces ready so they know we would attack if they tried to use their missiles or anything and, or make an attack. Well, this didn't seem to deter them either. Either they kept <coughs> spinning the centrifuges, getting more of the uranium, highly er enriched uranium. They also have sources of plutonium, so they can use that to make a bomb. And they have an alliance with China. They send a lot of their scientists to China. China has had the bomb for 40 years. So they have a lot of expertise which they could provide the North Koreans. Now, let's see, Obama left office and then Trump, Trump came in. In this year, there's been tremendous development in the North Korean program. They've developed more missiles, much longer range. And the last, they've done 15 tests this year. The last two have been fairly long range missiles. There are short range missiles, mid range missiles, and the long range missiles are the ICBMs, the Intercontinental Continental Ballistic Missiles. So the last two they sent over Japan and they actually landed in the Pacific. The, the last one was in early September and it went more than 3,000 miles. A lot of it was vertical. 
but of course they could send it horizontally when they wanted to. So that means they could reach Guam, which is 2,200 miles away. Hawaii is about 4,500 miles away, so that particular missile launch wouldn't get that far, but they're continuing to work on their missiles. And our intelligence believes that in a few months, probably next year, they will have uh, full-fledged ICBMs, which can reach Hawaii. Honolulu is a city of half a million people. And along the northern route, they can reach uh, the United States, Alaska. There aren't too many targets in Alaska, but it could come all the way around to the west coast and potentially even farther. This has been a very scary prospect for Americans. You mean that little small country over there could actually shoot a missile with a nuclear warhead and land it in an American city? It, has, it does have people rightfully scared. We should remember, however, that the Russians have had ICBMs pointed at Minneapolis, St. Paul, Washington, and other American cities for almost 60 years. Even when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian kept their missile arsenal. They're still there. Supposedly, they could shoot them if they wanted to, but we trust that they're reasonably sane people, and we have agreements that will act in a rational way, so we really don't even think about it too much anymore. Although it's still possible, they haven't gone away. The Chinese first got the bomb 40 years ago, and people were, there was great fears, maybe the Chinese will shoot a missile at us. And they do have about 20 ICBMs that can reach our west coast from China, about 8,000 miles. But again, we don't think about this very much because we've developed a reasonably good relationship with China and we don't think there'd be any case where they would want to do that to us. So this may be the case again where we have a third country which can actually reach us with a nuclear weapon on a missile and we may have to live with this situation. <coughs> the other options don't appear to be very promising. The other thing that has happened this year, of course, have been all these threats, which you've heard from uh, Trump said, at the UN, the Agency for Diplomacy and Cooperation, he said, we may be forced to totally destroy North Korea. He said that publicly to the whole world, that they would force us to destroy them. He also said they might have fire and fury the likes of which the world has never seen, which it certainly implies nuclear weapon. Nikki Haley, the ambassador to the UN, said they're begging for a war, the North Koreans. So these are very alarming threats. We all know that Trump makes outrageous statements. He does that quite often, but some, in some case they may turn out to be true. We hope not. In uh, return, the North Koreans have said They'll reduce Japan and the United States to dust and ashes. And you can go into shops by the DMZ in North Korea and you can buy posters and videos and they show a North Korean rocket soaring through the sky and then smashing into the Capitol or the White House. They're very common around North Korea. So they've made their threats also. And we've heard just in the last few weeks about the old dotard or the mental case they called Trump and Trump said I won't call him fat and short after he just did that. <laughs> so that, I mean there's sort of an adolescent quality to this but we better take it seriously because of the forces these two men command. Now what are the forces that the various sides have? It's the most heavily, heavily militarized region of the world right now. North Korea has a huge army, 1,200,000. That includes the uh, Air Force and Navy. They have a small Navy and small Air Force. So the actual army may be just over 1 million. 21,000 artillery pieces, 3,500 tanks, 600 planes, and also some boats. There's a few hundred small boats, which aren't a big factor. 
Most of this equipment is very old. They don't have an industrial base in North Korea, so they use old Russian equipment and some Chinese equipment too. They have old MiG jets and they fix them up and they use those. So they're considered to be obsolete by our standards. We wouldn't use equipment like this. Their artillery also are old-fashioned cannons. And by the DMZ they have them in tunnels and then they can bring them out and shoot. But uh, they work and they're effective. They can shoot to uh, cause a lot of damage. The reserves, the reserves there I put at three to five million. No one really knows but you know they could draw on a huge pool of people if they figured there was an all-out war because most of the young people in North Korea go into the army. A lot of girls also. Their education goes up through about 11th grade and then the army is the main employer. So they have a lot of potential reserves. The missiles, they don't have very many actually. Short range to shoot into South Korea, about 50. Mid range, uh, these go from maybe 800 miles up to 1500 or so. 10 and five ICBMs. Now even though that's not many, just one with a nuclear weapon can destroy a city. So they're extremely dangerous and very lethal. The South Korean forces, um, one objective of North Korea has been to take over the South and then the North would control it and make it a communist state like the North. The South Koreans want no part of this, of course, so they built up their own army. 600,000, they're a little bit <coughs> more than half the size of the North Korean army. Two to four million reserves, 11,000 artillery, 2,400 tanks, but their equipment is very modern because they get a lot of it from us and they get it from other countries which have developed uh, modern armaments. They also have industry in South Korea, modern shipbuilding industry and so forth. So they have a big advantage with much uh, newer equipment. Jay, do you know the populations of the two Koreas? Yes, uh, North Korea is 25 million and South Korea is 51 million. Wow, twice the size. Twice the size. And the, you know, the economic base or something is 40 or 50 times as much the way that they've developed. But half the people in South Korea live within 40 miles of the center of Seoul. They're all really concentrated in this huge urban area. So they're vulnerable to attack in that area. Now, what forces do we have over there? The U.S., actually, we have Japan as an ally for us, too, but they contribute a relatively small amount. In South Korea, we have had we've have 30,000 troops, and they're well-trained. They have a slogan, be ready to fight tonight, so they train continually. But 30,000 is quite a small number compared to the previous numbers from the two countries. In Japan, we have about 55,000 troops. We now have three aircraft carriers in the region. I should have put aircraft carrier strike group because an aircraft carrier has about 20 other boats that accompany it. They have uh, cruisers and destroyers and a submarine and all together, they have about 5,000 men on the carrier itself and probably about 3,000 on the other boats floating portable airfields with modern high-tech jet fighters and fighter bombers. So we have the equipment, the high-tech things we need, but the numbers are really don't look all that good if you get into any kind of a long war. Uh, we also have interceptors for missiles. Now the, there are about four types of these. The Patriots are for short range missiles. So you may remember the Patriots in the first Gulf War. They've got a new and impro improved version. It apparently works quite well. So if they shoot short range missiles into South Korea, Patriots hopefully will knock out most of them. But they won't be able to knock out all of them. 
The Aegis missiles are on Navy cruisers. They can shoot up to 300 miles high. Um, the, the longer the range, the less accurate your missiles or interceptors will be. They've been tested a lot, but not really much in combat. We don't know how well they'll work. THAAD means Theater High Altitude Aerial Defense. We sent two of these batteries to South Korea, and then we added four more. The South Koreans protested. They had thousands and thousands of people out protesting because they think this makes them a target. Also, some analysts think that we're actually getting ready to use Korea as kind of a base to eventually attack China, but that's off in the future. So the THAAD, again, is not very well tested. Hopefully it'll work, but if you send a lot of missiles, usually some of them, or even most of them, get through. GBI are ground-based interceptors. These are in Alaska and California. Now if uh, Kim should shoot a missile toward Hawaii, it would get there in about uh, 25 minutes. These things really move. The interceptors, they'd uh, detect them maybe after 10 minutes of launch. Then they'd launch these interceptors. They have to travel more than 2,000 miles, track the incoming missile. It's going three miles a second. It's really moving when it gets toward the end of its flight and tr then try to knock it out. Uh, during tests of these things, they claim 50% success, but a lot of critics say the tests really are not what actual uh, war conditions would be like, that you can't really rely on the tests are sort of set up to succeed. So again, we really don't know how well these interceptor missiles will work. 2,000 miles and trying to shoot something going three miles a second is quite a high-tech feat. But we do have some interceptors. They could also, of course, they would shoot several missiles at once. They might have some with decoys, so maybe t two missiles would have the real warheads and the, the first five or six would be decoys, so we might shoot down the wrong ones. So there are all kinds of problems with intercepting these missiles. The offense is well ahead of the defense. Now, if it came to a war, and um, the article by Nicholas Kristof, uh, he interviewed several experts, and they estimate the chances are 25 to 40 percent in the next six to eight months. Now, that is really quite high. It means it probably will not happen, but we're still on this collision course. We've been on for many months now. The general scenario is that the North Korean forces would collapse in three to six weeks. They don't have any allies. They have old obsolete equipment. And then they would run out of money. Kim is supposed to have a stash of huge amounts of money. He pays off people around him, bribes them for their loyalty. And if they don't cooperate, he executes them. But how much he has, we don't know. North Korea engages in a lot of criminal activity around the world, drug laundering and so on. So they do have a stash of money. But the sanctions may be eating into that, the financial sanctions, which were announced about a month ago. Uh, North Korean soldiers always claim uh, to be hungry. They've always had food shortages in the North. So that may be another problem for them. The biggest problem is oil. An army runs on oil, and if they run out of oil, then they'll probably steadily collapse because you can't run your machines without oil. Now, what role does China have to play in this? The most populous country in the world and the, the uh, leading country in that region. Well, according to Graham Allison, he says they the old ties between communist countries are just not there anymore. So even though North Korea is technically communist and China is, they don't really take that into too much account. They go by their own interest. 
And China mainly wants stability. They don't want a war on the Korean Peninsula because they might have to deal with millions of refugees. There's a 500-mile border China shares with North Korea now. Huge number of refugees could come across. And then there would just be major disruption of various kinds, and they want stability. So they will not intervene the way they did in the first Korean War when they took those huge losses. They'll sort of give North Korea maybe a little support so they don't collapse suddenly, but they're not going to send huge military forces across. Nobody wants this Kim Jong-in around. Everybody basically wants to see him gone, including China. But they'll just play the situation however it works out for their own interest so that they have stability in the region. They also don't want a Korean peninsula controlled by the United States. If there was a war and we won the war and then we decided we'd basically run both halves of Korea, China would consider that to be confrontational towards them. So they might take steps to prevent that. But they probably won't play a major military role in any conflict. <clears throat> now we don't want to get into a ground invasion. We've all seen the trouble we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan. North Korea is a lot like Af Afghanistan. The mountains are a little lower, but it's a very rugged country. Thousands of hiding places, caves in the mountains and everything else. Brutally cold weather in the winter. Um, one option that they may be thinking of is decapitation. Uh, you can look up Mike Pompeo, North Korea, on your computer, and you'll see a conference about six weeks ago in which he said, well, there might be an accident in North Korea, and Kim might vanish. So he said that publicly. publicly he probably shouldn't have. Uh, Mike Pompeo was the director of the CIA. So that was a veiled threat. You know, he might have a decapitation strategy. Remember also that Trump said, Rocket Man won't be around much longer. That's another threat. So they may be planning a decapitation um, event. We don't know. Cyber warfare is very important these days. Of course, we have people all the time using cyber techniques. You may remember with Iran, we sent that Stuxnet worm into their centrifuges and messed up their centrifuges with the approval of Obama. That was about eight years ago. So we're continually, continually looking for ways to interfere with their uh, operations. Uh, Kim Jong-un has conducted 84 tests, and most of them have failed. And it could be just faulty equipment. It's difficult to get these things to work right, but there may be some cyber sabotage going on. Another interesting uh, development was that after their latest missile test, the one that went over Japan 3,000 miles, they haven't had another one for more than two months now. So we're wondering, you know, why not? You know, they've been coming pretty steadily. Well, there was an earthquake after the, that test. It may have been caused by the test or it may have been independent, but it may have weakened the area around the launch site because Japanese TV has reported there was a tunnel collapse in that about October 10th and 200 workers were killed. Now, this has not been independently verified, so we can't be sure this happened, but it's, you can look it up on their computer and it's there, the reports from Japanese sources. And it's probably a weakening of the mountain from the nuclear tests, but there is an outside um, possibility that it could be some kind of sabotage. So he may be working at intimidation from the outside and sabotage from the inside. Now if a war breaks out, um, you've all heard about the artillery at the DMZ shooting into Seoul. 
Well, these are not quite as bad as you might think. The DMZ is about 150 miles long, and only the last 30 miles on the west side is opposite Seoul. And most of their cannons are shorter range. They can't reach Seoul. So they do have probably a couple thousand, but they won't have thousands and thousands. But let's say they had 2,000 cannon that could reach Seoul. They could uh, destroy large areas of the city. They could kill thousands of people and start a war. The U.S. Air Force would be able to take these out probably in two or three days, but they could uh, do a lot of damage before we were able to take care of them. So that's in case North Korea starts uh, action to generate a war. Now there are tough decisions for our leaders here to make in this whole situation. Mattis, uh, the sec Secretary of Defense, McMaster, the National Security Advisor, and Dunford is the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. If uh, Kim attacks Seoul with artillery or sends troops across, what do we do? What's our response? Um, Trump might give an order, bomb Pyongyang, two million people. Do they carry this out? Do they do that? Is that proportional? Would that be a reasonable response? Um, they're supposed to follow the orders of the commander-in-chief, commander but they don't have to follow illegal orders. So if they determined the order was illegal, they might decide not to follow it, which could, would cause a crisis in command. Also, Moon Jae-in is the new president of South Korea. Let's say a war started, Kim started the war, and uh, Trump said, okay, you're on, we want you to invade the North. You will be our proxy. We really don't have the ground force of the US. There would be tremendous resistance in South Korea. This would mean thousands and thousands of Koreans killing other Koreans. Would he go along with this? There would be a lot of resistance right in his own country. So there are all kinds of difficult situations. Um, people could, uh, they have shelters and they, they uh, have drills regularly and they have shelters for everybody in Seoul. More than 20 million people, 10 times as large as the Twin Cities, huge city. And the sirens go off and they go down in the train stations, basically in the shelters. And they're effective, but how long do you want to live in shelters? Maybe uh, Americans, there are 150,000 Americans in Seoul. They would probably want to be evacuated fairly soon. Are we ready to evacuate 150,000 people while we're involved in the middle of a war? Maybe after a couple of months, the Koreans themselves wouldn't want to stay in the shelters continually being attacked if the war were to continue. They might want evacuation. So the president of South Korea, are you going to ev evacuate two million people? Five million people? How do you do this in the middle of a war? Tremendously difficult decisions. And then, of course, we have the threshold of using a nuclear weapon. Now, we all hope that Trump makes wild exaggerations and nearly everything he says is a wild exaggeration. But he can do it on his own authority. We'll get to what Congress is trying to do to stop him in a few minutes. You know, he's, he's made uh, threats, not specifically with a nuclear weapon, but during the campaign, he said, well, if we have nuclear weapons, why can't we use them? He didn't seem to understand they're used for deterrence. They're not supposed to be actually shot and blown up in a city of another country. Also, Kim has at least 20 nuclear weapons, maybe more. And if his country was going down and collapsing rapidly, he could decide to shoot a couple at Seoul with devastating consequences. The nuclear weapons we have now are often 20 to 30 times as powerful as the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
So it's almost imaginable what a nuclear weapon would do in the city of Seoul. We must do everything to prevent this from ever happening. But people get very irrational when the war fever develops and may decide to do something really crazy or irrational. Now, what can we tell Congress, or what messages should we be sending them? The number one message, and I put that in caps, is there must not be a war on the Korean Peninsula. We just cannot have a war there. It would be devastating. It would, all sides would lose, especially the Korean people. The economic, psychic, and social consequences would just be immense. Getting back to how this war would develop, we all know from history that predictions of a six-week war usually don't pan out. In 1914, they said, well, we shouldn't have a war. There's no reason for a war. And the sides were lined up. That crazy student shot the Duke and his, Archduke and his wife, and the war was on. Well, they said, um, the Germans told their troops We'll hook around Paris and it'll take six weeks and the war will be over. Then in the fall, the British decided to send their troops over. They said, you'll be home by Christmas. This was in 1914. And you'll, we all remember what happened with World War I. So wars tend to, war plans tend to um, go awry once the shooting starts. So many different possibilities could develop. And even a single incident, like that 1914 one, could start a war. Um, rocket shot into Seoul. The other day, the North Koreans shot a defector and uh, put five bullets in his body. That was an incident. Fortunately, it didn't start anything more, we hope. But there could be a sinking of a ship. All kinds of things could happen that would initiate the war. Another example of the six-week strategy, remember when uh, we invaded Iraq in 2003. Six weeks later, Bush was on the aircraft carrier with a mission accomplished banner behind him. Now he said, well, that was because the, the boat had accomplished its mission, but the message was major combat operations are over. We have won the war. He really had believed that at the time, I think. Well, we all realize that it was quite a different story. The war was just beginning. So the North Koreans are very tough people. They fought a very tough war with us once before. We might run into supply problems too. We have Tomahawk missiles, high-tech weapons, but we don't have a big supply. Maybe in about two weeks, we would start to run out of those. We've used an awful lot of bombs over in the Middle East. So we'd have to send a lot of them over from the United States. We have troops in Okinawa and we've tr we have troops in Guam. But we do still are well outnumbered in numbers of troops. And we have about the same number of troops overall as the North Koreans, except ours are all over the world. Most of them are here in the US, but we have troops in the Middle East and troops in Asia and troops in Africa. And it would take a long time to assemble a substantial force if it turned into a, a ground war, which is what we don't want. So almost, there's almost no scenario where a war would be effective or work quickly to our advantage. Trump could possibly decide and he and Mattis have both said this, that they have to denuclearize. Means not only halt their weapons program where it is, but get rid of their missiles, and get rid of their, their uh, rockets, and get rid of their uranium, and so on. And if they don't do it, maybe we'll bomb them all. We know they have eight launch sites, we know where they are, but we don't know where they keep all their underground stuff. There's tunnels, they keep a lot of material and equipment in different places. We would probably not be able to bomb or destroy most of their nuclear program. They would 
there's a lot of hiding places in North Korea and they would probably be able to maintain it. They also might give some of their weapons to other countries, some other countries that have terrorists or people who would potentially use them against us. So it would not be an easy matter to try to destroy or denuclearize their program there. So what are the options? One is freeze for freeze. North Korea and China said they would work with us on this. They would halt their program. In other words, they would keep the missiles and, and uh, equipment they have now, but they would stop testing and stop sending missiles. So they wouldn't get a long range ICBM to threaten the United States. In return, we in South Korea and the Japanese would back off these war maneuvers. We've been doing this for years and years and years, right off their coast and we fly planes over their country and practice bombing runs and so on. Uh, as Nicholas Kristof said, there's been really been no movement on this though, but hopefully there, there can be. Another important um, strategy is to establish a peace treaty finally. 1953, technically the two sides are still at war. This would probably take a long time, six months to a year or more, but this is the one way we could eventually lead to reunification of the two Koreas. Track two, this is called track two because it's not normal government channels. Suzanne DiMaggio and Joel Witt are very experienced <coughs> diplomats who have been meeting with their North Korean counterparts for many years. And they meet in different cities, Geneva and uh, Europe some places and Asia sometimes, and they have a good rapport with them. They uh, report that they believe that Kim's program is defensive. They don't believe he's crazy. They don't believe he's offensive and then that he wants to destroy countries or destroy cities, that this is his main defense. He feels very threatened by the United States and the threats of the United States. So he's developing this program and the ICBMs for defensive reasons. That's what they believe and they've worked with him for many years. But they also say that the last year with Obama, the kind of relations kind of went sour. And they were hoping a new president with Trump, that things might improve. But, of course, things have gotten much worse. And they hear these wild threats, and so their question is, and you can look this up on political website, is this man crazy? That's their question, and it's a legitimate question. These wild threats to destroy their country. A second um, item from their <coughs> discussions is that uh, they really feel that they want to reach an agreement, that they don't want a war. They know they would have huge losses. They know the South Koreans would have huge losses. They would have Koreans killing Koreans. That they really want to work somehow to get an agreement to avoid a war. So it's very important that these track two negotiations continue. Another a possibility is to send Jimmy Carter and William Perry. Jimmy Carter once before helped stop a potential attack from the North. If you remember going as a private citizen about 20 years ago, the North Koreans trust him. He's in his 90s now, but he's still very capable. William Perry is 90 years old, the former Secretary of Defense, but he's also worked with the North Koreans and uh, they trust him as well. So they could be two very good envoys. Now there's been a flurry act of activity in Congress because our members of Congress basically want to rein in Trump. They don't want to make, have him commit us to an unauth unconstitutional, unauthorized, and even nuclear strike on North Korea. Uh, Bob Corker, remember who had that uh, argument with Trump about three weeks ago, he's holding hearings now on the authority 
of launching a nuclear attack. Can we have anyone else besides just the president do this? He says, well, we haven't had hearings for 40 years. We better have them. But uh, you, you certainly realize this is directly dealing with, with the danger of Trump. Uh, Chris Murphy in the Senate. Uh, the number there I typed wrong, so I hope you can read it. 2047. Ed Markey in the Senate also 2016. And uh, Thomas Massey and John Conyers in the House. 4140. So they've just introduced this legislation the last two or three weeks. It takes time to get co-sponsors. It takes time to to discuss it. To uh, discuss it. it takes time to bring it to the floor. There's almost an atmosphere of panic when you read about these bills that they're trying to get together. They are very worried that Trump might launch an unconstitutional unnecessary and possibly even nuclear strike on North Korea. They don't want to say that publicly, but they're trying to get these bills going so you can look them up and see the details and, and see where they are. But it does take time to get any bills and you've got to get a consensus from large numbers of Congress to get them through. So that's the situation we're in. It's very dangerous. Um, We've had a lot of distraction with a lot of other news, but this should be the main news item that we should be dealing with over the next several months and figuring out what we can do to <coughs> avoid another Korean War. So I will take uh, questions now on this, and then afterwards we'll go to the um, UN Treaty. Yes, Joe. Thank you for your analysis. At the outset of your remarks, you said there were essentially four options. For the sake of argument, let me suggest a fifth. Okay. And that is to do nothing at all. Because um, we assume that, uh, and you assume, that um, Kim is rational, uh, even though he acts more or less irrationally. But he knows that um, he, along with most of North Korea, would um, disappear from the earth within days if not weeks of the start of a war and um, I think very few people start wars when they will be a victim of that war within a very short time span so why, why not um, put further emphasis on, on the do nothing strategy yes that um, Bowden deals with this and Graham Allison says he believes that in a year from now we'll be basically at the same place we are now so in effect, that's the kind of the do nothing. Um, what we're hoping, as you said, that Kim is rational enough to know his country would be destroyed. Also, Trump, of course, is interested in his approval and his place in history. If he started a war that killed thousands of Americans, his approval would go down even lower. So that, hopefully, is a, reason, a good reason to restrain Trump. So that's, a, that's where we may end up basically in a similar situation, do nothing. It's not uh, something we really should be comfortable with, but it may turn out that way. Yes, Gail. Well, um, this is a related question. It seems to me the most important question is what motive would either the U.S. or North Korea have to launch an attack on the other? And I don't see any motive that a that North Korea would have to be the aggressor. Um, if it were, if there were an attack, um, I don't know what motive the U.S. would have to attack North Korea. Um, of the two leaders, I it seems to me that Trump is more unpredictable than than uh, Kim Jong Un. Anyway, um, is there a motive on either side? Well, the motive on the U.S. side is to destroy their nuclear program. We, we have given them basically ultimatums. You must denucle, denuclearize. In other words, get rid of your missiles, get rid of your bombs, get rid of your facilities, or we will make you. So that would be the motive for an attack by us because we believe that 
his ICBMs could th directly th threaten Americas in a large city like Seoul or Tokyo or Honolulu or even the West Coast. And according, and McMaster and Mattis have both said this, we can't allow that. We can't allow him to ever attack us. And the way to keep it from ever attacking us is to de destroy his facilities. So that would be the motive for us starting a, a military action. Which is clearly illegal. Oh, yes. And that's what they're discussing at uh, Corker hearings now. That's internationally illegal, not just U.S. illegal. Yes, sir. Well, there's a mountain in the far north of North Korea, and it's a sacred mountain to the people. And I don't know the details, but CNN had a reporter, Will Ripley, who traveled there, gave a report about <laughs> six weeks ago. And he said, people have great reverence for this area because their leaders, in a sense, descended from the gods. Now, I don't know how to take that literally or not, but they came from a kind of higher than worldly sphere. And so they should be revered as descendants of these higher beings. And so they make pilgrimages up to this mountain and they give great reverence to whoever is the current leader. And of course, the leader plays that for all he's worth. And they have these adoring crowds and huge parades and so on, but I would compare it somewhat to the Japanese world in World War II with Hirohito. Maybe not to quite the extent the Japanese had this emperor worship, but it's, it's of a similar nature, something we're not too familiar with here in the West, but it's, it has a spiritual significance for them. So he not only has military power and political power, he also has a spiritual power over the people. Yes. But related, I guess kind of related to that, how are the, what do the people themselves think? You said they study at age four, they're propagandized in essence, and they're growing up with this, and this is their whole society. But in reality, what do you know about how much people see through that, or are they really beholden to this? What kind of percentage? Well, Nicholas Kristof said, they really seem to be behind their leader. He was there about a month ago. Will Ripley, in his report, he encountered about 10, he had about 10 meetings. And he had the first two minutes, they'd be suspicious of him. Children would run away. They'd be afraid of the American. But after two minutes, they would open up and they'd have some friendly conversations. And he went to Pyongyang and they have a lot of new buildings. They have a shopping mall. They have iPhones. They have fashion shops that women can shop at, things like that. It's not quite as dark and grim as we've been led to believe. And then he went out in the countryside, and they have a DVD and TV, but it's all state-run. They don't have internet. They have intranet, so it's just within the country. So they don't get outside news sources or anything. So all their news sources are information comes from the government. So it's hard to know what's in their hearts, but I'm, I'm sure the great majority of people there don't want war. And they, you know, they go to soccer games and they go to school and they go to work and they, a lot of them do their own farming, grow their own food and so forth. So it's not everybody who's marching in those parades and it's basically the government and Kim himself who's doing all these threats and everything. So hopefully there's a big human aspect to the people of North Korea. So when their military or their government might start to break down, then you might have this more human aspect take over and the government might uh, fade fairly quickly. Graham Allison said there might be even a chance of that. It's fairly remote, but we might have a very positive outcome if this is handled in a very a convincing way. Yes. Uh, I've heard
sure that the, the people of North Korea are very proud of their country's development of nuclear weapons and uh, nuclear capability and that they really admire the leader in part because of, of this advancement and uh, that it seems to me that um, North Korea has, uh, it's very rational for them to want nuclear weapons uh, as a deterrent uh, to uh, attack. That doesn't seem crazy to me that they they'd want to develop that capability and maintain it. Yeah, that's the way most, most of observers see it, including DiMaggio and Witt, who are experts on this subject, that uh, this is all a strategy to have a very powerful deterrence so we don't attack them. Right. You can see why they're paranoid about the United States, especially going back to the history of the original Korean War. And, and our attacks on uh, Libya and uh, uh, Iraq, uh, why would they think they would be immune from that? Right. <coughs> they were put in the axis of evil. Yes, sir. You talked about how in peace treaty could possibly lead to reunification. I'm having a hard time imagining what reunification would look like when you've got two countries as different in levels of development in terms of the political culture, the economic culture, and everything. You can see the difficulty that even Germany has had um, uniting the two, and there, the differences are far apart. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, Allison mentions that it would be more difficult than Germany. <coughs> Germany was difficult enough. So there's, it would be a long, difficult process. But hopefully, just being Korean and having some success during the Sunshine Policy, he sees a very outside chance of eventually the momentum developing, but it may take five years, 10 years, and it would take the collapse of this current North Korean regime, I think. So maybe that's a, an outside chance, but it's something they have to hope for and maybe eventually work for. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. It seems strange to me, too, that that they could maintain this huge army, deprive their people of a lot of... Uh, well, I, I guess the, the question I have is also just in terms of um, illusion. It, it seems to me as if the United States is as obsessed about this, um, this threat. I mean, certainly it's a serious one, but, but, but really, I'm just having a hard time understanding the, the, um, the degree of rhetoric at this point when you consider the actual magnitude. Yeah, I don't really have an answer for that except that uh, North Korean culture, apparently when you insult somebody, they really take it personally. So that's why the insults, insults come back. But I don't see a really good long-term strategy for them either. They don't have any allies. Well, and, uh, no allies, and, and no, I mean, unless I'm missing something here, but it, it doesn't appear to me as if they really have energy self-sufficiency either, really. I mean, is that a fair assessment? I mean, 
that they're not, I mean, that they're creating nuclear weapons, but they don't really have a, a, a self-sufficient power organization, do they? Or well, I think you're right. I don't know the answer. Yes, sir. been to Korea three times. I'm not a Korean expert, but you know what Juche is, the philosophy of self-reliance in North Korea. That culture has sustained its uh, integrity in between China and Japan. For thousands of years, they've been tiny. And they will go to the bone against uh, external threat. And that's what he's trying to do. Jay is trying to also convey part of the culture. It doesn't have to make sense to you. Well, They'll I mean, kill everybody well, that they can if they are attacked. But, but as I understand it, they really have no self yeah, But you don't understand that correctly. Well, they yeah. are surviving now. No, I understand. They obviously can I, take care I, of themselves. They live at a lower standard of living. They're willing to sacrifice 10% of their population, and they're willing to die by the millions, killing hundreds of thousands of Americans and millions of South Koreans, if necessary, to retain their but independence. They don't have, have oil to run their regime. They don't. They just need oil for a few days to rain hundreds of thousands of artillery, artillery shells on South Korea. And they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons because one of them can wipe out 30,000 Americans in Osan Air Base in, in Seoul. That's if they don't drive one up in a boat and set it off in uh, San Francisco Harbor or Los Angeles. And uh, I'm going to stop here. I'm trying to be very forceful, but I am doing that to convey to you. When you're up against a mountain, tough, people. They are tough beyond most city people's ability to comprehend, if I may be so blunt. And they will go to the ground trying to kill their adversary, even if you outnumber them a hundred or a thousand to one. Jushi. J-U-C-H-E. I still, I still understand. I, I, I guess they can be as mean as they want to, but they don't have gas in the tank. They're not going to be free. Uh, they don't need gas. Yes, to they do. I'm afraid they do. Any any war economy requires actual material. And and they've got it, enough in their missiles to deliver them. They've got enough to drive a I, diesel I, submarine. Sorry, I, I don't mean to be. They don't about have this. to run a tank army for two months to fight you. You're right that they can't run a tank army for two months. I'm not suggesting they're not. Uh, I think maybe we should. Uh, <laughs> move okay. along on the program and uh, maybe we can have another program just on this issue and uh, discuss a debate or you two can carry on after, after the meeting. Okay, I'd like to take a short time on this UN treaty, the second page of your handout here. <coughs> a historic, we hope, historic event happened on July 7th of this year. Didn't get nearly the media coverage it should have. But the United Nations General Assembly adopted a landmark agreement to prohibit nuclear weapons. I circled the website for you. It's the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons org. This involved 468 groups <coughs> from all over the world. People have been working on this several hundred thousand for years now. They met in New York and put together this treaty. 122 countries adopted the treaty in July. Uh, this means there are about 70 countries that didn't, of course, but it's still more than 60% of the world's countries, including the entire Southern Hemisphere. And this treaty will prohibit developing, testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, stockpiling, using, or threatening to use nuclear weapons or transferring them. In other words, these countries are going to get rid of these rotten things. Uh, the, the treaty 
open for signing in September to get it uh, to make it official had to have 50 countries sign it so 53 have signed it so far the head of state and then it needs 50 countries to ratify it so they have to take it back to their home country present it to their legislative body their Congress and then that body has to agree to the treaty that will take a while, so it may take up to another year to get 50 countries to ratify it. But once they get the 50 ratified, then it will go into force as international law in those countries. So this hopefully is a huge step forward. Now, of course, you know that international law is often disregarded by big, powerful countries. In 1928, there was great excitement over the Kellogg-Briand Treaty, which uh, made war, aggressive war, illegal. It was ratified by the U.S. Senate 85 to 1. A uh, decade later, we were in the worst war in history because Japan and Germany just ignored it, and then we had to respond to that. So. It doesn't mean that suddenly all uh, disarmament will start to take place all over the place. But it can be effective when it becomes uh, illegal to have these weapons. Uh, biological weapons were prohibited in the 1970s, chemical weapons in the 1980s, cluster bombs in the 1990s, and landmines in the 2000s. They're still around, of course, especially we know the chemical weapons. This Kim in North Korea has chemical weapons, but there are a lot fewer of them, and they're less of a threat in many parts of the world. So international law can be effective that way. Of course, the nine countries that have the nuclear weapons didn't, take, didn't want any part of this treaty. The North Koreans, interestingly enough, did send a delegation as observers. They didn't sign it, but they wanted to find out what was going on. And then there are still uh, another 50 or 60 countries that potentially could decide to get them. The Non-Proliferation Treaty from 1970 has kept the number of countries to nine. So the last couple of decades we've kept the uh, nuclear weapons from proliferating, but countries to, other countries could still try to get them, like Turkey or Egypt or South Korea or Japan or others. So there are no guarantees with this treaty. Uh, two countries who did not adopt it that were a disappointment were Canada. We were hoping they would sign on. But the U.S. convinced most of its allies not to sign on. And Japan. Japan, of course, had a peaceful constitution after World War II. And they suffered the most from nuclear weapons, of course, with the two bombings. But there's a faction in Japan that thinks maybe we should start thinking of getting our own to protect ourselves from... North Korea or other nations that may threaten us. So there was a big enough faction in Japan to keep them from, from adopting the treaty. But um, this hopefully will be a day in history, July 7, 2017. At one time there were 70,000 nuclear weapons back 35 years ago. Huge overkill, mainly the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Now we have 15,000. So 78% have been um, disarmed. Of course, it just takes one to destroy a city. There's also loose nuclear material, which is highly enriched uranium, which occurs, or uranium oxide occurs in many places on the Earth. It's fairly plentiful. And plutonium, which is, can only produce be produced in the laboratory. There's enough of that material around, the uranium especially, to make tens of thousands of bombs. Uh, Obama gave a couple of eloquent speeches, especially in Prague in 2009, 
but working toward a world without nuclear weapons. Under his tenure, eight years, we reduced 1,200 warheads. So it's pretty slow going, but at least it's going in the right direction. The Obama people did an excellent job with the loose nuclear material. The uh, 20 nations uh, certified they disposed of their loose nuclear material. So I believe there are 24 left that have to take care of that problem. So this will take many, many years yet. There's a long way to go. There are a lot of roadblocks and obstacles in the way. It may take decades, but this is a really great ray of sunshine in our current atmosphere. And I can the group that sponsored the treaty received the Nobel Peace Prize in October, and they got a good publicity for that. Some of the Nobel Peace Prize recipients have been questionable, of course, we know, but I think this was well-deserved and will give great recognition to continuing efforts to get rid of these weapons, make a world for the next generation where <coughs> we're free of this horrible threat we've lived with ever since 1942. And in closing, I just want to mention a great American hero it can be a model, and that was William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison, in about 1825, noticed that uh, slaves were being mistreated, human beings bought and sold. And he decided, this is wrong. We have to abolish slavery. We must get rid of this institution of slavery. He had everybody against him. The plantation owners were against him, of course, the big business of the time. Uh, Congress was against him. Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and John C. Calhoun denounced him from the floor of, of the Senate. Um, the churches were against him also because slavery was part of the social structure of the time. He had a few Quaker women with him, but he kept at it year after year. He put out a newspaper on Saturday mornings called The Liberator, five cents a nickel for The Liberator. 35 years he kept at it. He was almost lynched once. His friends got the noose off him just in time. His printing presses were smashed. He was harassed in various ways, but he picked up the great orator of Fred Frederick Douglass, Wendell Phillips. He gradually won people over, and he kept at it because he knew he was right. 35 years, and he lived to see, on the first day of 1863, Abraham Lincoln sign the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. So there's a model for what we can do. It may take 30 for years, 40 years, 50 years, but we should believe it can be done. Thank you. Any more questions? Don. Well, we shouldn't forget about uh, Barack Obama under his administration. was spending a, uh, authorized a trillion dollar upgrade of the nuclear weapons system. And some people would say, to make it even more likely that there could be a first dragon sense that it would be much more penetrating into the ground and something, things that would uh, destabilize the world. Well, that was a big disappointment after he made that <coughs> speech in Prague. We were very hopeful and uh, yes, I have to say that was a big disappointment. And they're debating it now, and how much even cost overruns that may cost even more and and you know things may go the wrong direction for a while yes my my reading on that uh, Don was that he felt he had to give that in order to get Congress uh, to support the Iran nuclear deal I'm not saying that was a good decision but that's what uh, I understood and what's behind it. Okay, yes. Other questions? Any others? 
Well, thank you all, and I hope you have some information for the important decisions we have to make going ahead here.